Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and we would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava, and today we are going to investigate the basics of long and short futures trading, how it can be used to hedge business risk, and why margining is so important to enable futures trading from the perspective of both counterparties involved and the exchange. And we are going to investigate it based on the case studies, two simple ones in terms of crude oil futures trading and wheat futures trading. For our long situation, we will be walking in the shoes of a manufacturing company that quite heavily uses oil in their operations, and uh, purchasing oil for their needs can constitute a large chunk of their costs. So it's quite obvious that they might want to hedge their exposure to the ever-changing price of oil and uh, make their costs more predictable to eliminate or at least reduce their business risks in that regard. So here we investigate futures trading in brand crude oil and we assume that our company wants to hedge exposure to oil prices and they will need the oil at the end of November 2020. And currently assume that we are at the end of September 2020, 30th of September to be precise. And two important values to look at before we start any further analysis is to consider what is the contract size for futures trading at an exchange and what is the value per point or per unit in terms of futures contract pricing. As we can see here, the spot price for oil, that is, at how much uh, can you purchase oil right now at the spot market, is quoted in dollars per barrel, barrel being a unit of oil volume, while futures price is quoted at units per contract, and contract can be denominated in uh, units valued uh, at varying amounts of um, dollars, and also a contract can constitute multiple barrels. And that's just the convention of futures trading, and you need to pay attention to it when evaluating anything with regards to these derivatives. But for oil, fortunately, it's quite straightforward and intuitive. Futures contracts for crude oil typically are denominated in thousands of barrels and uh, priced at units worth $1,000 each, meaning that this price in units per contract directly corresponds to equivalent dollars per barrel, but in terms of the futures contracts at that stage deliverable end of November 2020. But for generality, we can convert our price formally from units per contract into dollars per barrel by first multiplying it by value in dollars per point or per unit and then dividing by how many barrels there are in one contract. And this is trivial for oil but can be non-trivial and could lead to some discrepancies if you consider another futures or another derivative that is. And uh, here we need to consider why the maturity date, that is when oil is to be delivered, is exactly end of November 2020. And here again it's important to understand the conventions that exist in futures trading to enable liquid trading and uh, efficient price discovery within the exchange. For there to exist uh, a reasonable number of options to hedge exposures at different time periods, but also to not make the market too fragmented, it's generally agreed that uh, commodity futures have one specified maturity date per month. So for oil, those dates are month ends, and that's why our contract matures 30th of November 2020. Here, we are entering a long position on uh, crude oil, and we want 10,000 barrels to be delivered to us at November end 2020. And here it's actually quite important to understand whether we really want these $10,000 to be physically delivered to us as per our futures contract. 
because we as a manufacturing company have our own supply chains and we might not really want this physical oil. We might just want to hedge our financial risk. We have got someone who will deliver oil to us at whatever price there will be at the spot market at that particular time. But futures contracts and uh, buying it right now, longing it 30th of September 2020, and then uh, selling it or terminating it at the end of the period would uh, lead us to effectively hedging our exposure to this ever-changing price. So it's important that an absolute majority of futures contracts are actually not held until physical delivery, while forward contracts that are traded over the counter uh, that can allow for a less standardized uh, terms of delivery. You can negotiate oil to be delivered 28th of November 2020 at uh, 3 p.m. or whatever. Those are held into physical delivery, while futures contracts are heavily standardized and uh, are used to manage financial risk primarily. This out of the way, we can calculate how many contracts do we need to purchase if we want to hedge exposure to 10,000 barrels of oil price. And here we can just divide our position in barrels onto the contract size in barrels and get that we need to purchase 10 contracts. We need to long 10 futures contracts in brand crude. The contract value in dollars can be calculated in two ways. First, we can just multiply our position in barrels onto the futures price in dollars per barrel and get uh, $427,500. Or we could multiply our position in contracts by units per contract by value per point, value per unit, in terms of contract pricing and get exactly the same value. Both are equivalent, and uh, the fact that they are equivalent means that we made no mistakes so far with this particular calculation. Then it's important to understand what those two figures are, the initial margin and the margin call threshold. These are the requirements that the exchange, the intermediating party in those derivatives transactions, imposes on you to prevent any counterparty from strategic defaults. And strategic defaults are a very important part of why these are relevant, and we'll see why they're relevant when we calculate our incremental uh, payoffs as time goes on. But now it's important to understand that the initial margin is the sum that the exchange requires any counterparty that trades futures, either long or short, to deposit within the exchange in their margin accounts. So while you have got an open position, either long or short, the exchange would require you to deposit some amount of cash within the exchange and leave it there until you have fulfilled your contractual obligation. And most of the time, margin requirements are expressed as a percentage of your initial contract value, and this percentage values from asset to asset, from commodity to commodity, and uh, with time reflecting various riskiness and various propensity of counterparties to default strategically. In our case, given that our initial margin is uh, $60,000 and our contract value is $427,500, we can calculate our initial margin to be around 14%, which is quite typical of uh, commodity futures trading. You would see figures uh, ranging from typically 5% to 15%. And the margin call threshold is quite important while we maintain our margin throughout the period and we'll investigate where it comes into play a little bit later. Now, we can first of all see how our spot price in dollars per barrel interacts with the futures price in dollars per barrel. And here we see the graph, how the dynamics of both prices evolve through time. We can see that the changes in one price are closely reflected by the changes in another. And this is unsurprising, given that the commodity is the same, it's brand crude in both cases. But what is quite puzzling, to start with at least, is that at the end of September 2020, when there are still two months until the contract expires, there is a quite noticeable gap between the spot price and the futures price spot price being notably lower. But this gap visibly narrows down as the maturity date approaches. And that is a very important feature of futures trading. And uh, it is actually quite 
relevant and quite obvious if you think about it. Because right there, at the very end of our period, for example, 27th of uh, November 2020, or even at the start of the 30th of November 2020, futures contract with the delivery that is postponed to a particular date uh, becomes more and more like the spot delivery, which is right now. If something is to be delivered to you in two days, it's quite similar to something that's delivered to you right now. But when this discrepancy between the delivery dates shrinks further and further to one day, six hours, 15 minutes or whatever, then the nature of the two contracts become almost equivalent. And that's why you expect that at the end of the 30th of November 2020, the two prices will be exactly equivalent. The reason why this discrepancy arises in the first place is due to storage costs or holding costs, to be more general, and uh, time value of money considerations, and we'll investigate that further when we discuss futures valuations and arbitrage in the next video. As for now, we have to start calculating the profit and loss or the payoff of the futures contract that we have just entered. First of all, as we are a longing counterparty, so we hedged our exposure to oil price in the future by longing the futures, and we are effectively winning if the price that is prevalent right now on the market is higher than the one we have agreed to, well, because we can be happy that we are ending up paying less than we would have paid if we haven't negotiated our futures contract, and we are losing if the price is plummeting down below our agreed price, that is, the price we have fixed at the 30th of September 2020. Because if the price plummets down, you actually end up paying more than you would have paid if you have just negotiated a spot market transaction. So you, as that type of hedger, an unfortunate hedger, as I might say, would be quite upset with the transaction. So to reflect that, we can calculate daily profit and loss per barrel and in total by calculating the incremental differences in futures prices in dollars per barrel day by day. And uh, reflecting the fact that we are happy if the oil price goes up and sad when the oil price goes down, we can calculate it as the difference of um, futures price for oil today minus the futures price yesterday. Here we can see that our futures contract delivers us negative payoff as for now, because at this stage we would have been better off by paying $41.44 per barrel rather than $42.75 per barrel that we have already agreed upon. And this logic can be further extended by bottom right clicking it all the way down and calculating incremental uh, profit and loss day by day. Then, in terms of the total profit and loss, we just have to multiply this uh, daily profit and loss per barrel onto the contract size in terms of total position in barrels. And here we can see that in the first day, we have lost, that is, forgone, uh, more than $13,000 uh, worth of payoff, simply because the futures price decreased and we would have been better off if we negotiated the contract right there. And then we bottom like it all the way down and calculate incremental profit and loss for the total position at every single day. Then we can calculate cumulative uh, profit and loss by just altering the logic of the formula and comparing the price right now, not with the price yesterday, but with the price at the very start. Because, after all, this is the price that we'll ultimately end up paying at the end when oil is delivered uh, to our door or, or not, or we just cancel the future contract uh, at the end by reselling it at the price that's close um, to the spot price, isn't it? But regardless, we have to adjust it for the price that we will end up paying, nonetheless, at the very end. So here, we need to subtract the price at the start and lock the row here, as we don't want it to change and we want to compare the current price to the price that was there at the start. 
and this gives us cumulative payoffs. So, for example, the payoff at the second day is just the sum of incremental payoffs for the first two days, and that's quite intuitive. And the total cumulative payoff for the whole position for all the contracts we have negotiated would be the cumulative payoff per barrel times our position in barrels locked and enforced. And again, we can bottom right click it all the way down and get our cumulative payoff uh, across all the days when our contract is active. And we can see that at the very end, we actually end up winning quite a lot, uh, more than $48,000. And it's unsurprising, given that the price at the very end is quite a bit higher than the price we have negotiated. So as a hedger, as a manufacturing company that uh, ended up paying for their oil less than they would have paid if they just waited until the very end, we can be quite satisfied. And we can already calculate the total contract payoff by either referring to this uh, bottom cell with the final uh, cumulative payoff for the whole position, or alternatively by subtracting the price at the start from the price at the end and multiplying it by the total number uh, of barrels in our position and getting the same result. And again, it just means that we haven't made any mistakes so far and can be happy with our calculations. Now we have to consider what is going on within the exchange with the margining requirements. Well, why margin requirements are important can be actually seen here when we are encountering negative payoffs. At this stage, when our total cumulative payoff is almost minus $30,000, who would prevent us from just defaulting on our contractual obligations? So just saying that we would not honor our futures contract and just stick with either purchasing oil on the spot for this quite nifty price or negotiating a new one somewhere else with someone else. Imagine that um, there are no reputational mechanisms to keep such uh, people or organizations in check and uh, this uh, could have been the case at the very start of futures trading uh, in the uh, early centuries in the infancy of the financial markets. So basically the exchanges, the intermediating parties who oversaw these transactions and wanting to enable as much trading as possible, because obviously they make money on transaction fees after all, and uh, on the fact that counterparties do perform transactions on their platforms, they wanted to devise some mechanism for enforcing the contracts that are unprofitable to honor anymore. So how can you enforce someone to still honor the contract that delivers them minus $30,000 of payoff? Well, that's where margining comes into place. Because the exchange, in the situation that you have defaulted on your futures contract, can just take the cash you've deposited onto your margin account and compensate the counterparty that was harmed because of your default using these proceeds. And that will ensure that, first of all, there are fewer strategic defaults that are just defaults that happen because someone doesn't want to honor their obligations. And second, counterparties can uh, easily enter uh, such transactions without worrying that they would be left um, astray by someone who is not honorable or just uh, plainly fraudulent, given that even in that case, they would be compensated by the exchange from the margin payments the other counterparty undertook at the start. That's why at the very start, the very first day, we have no money deposited at the exchange's current account, and we need to deposit the initial margin worth $60,000 into the margin account within the exchange. So we can refer to this cell, denoting that we have indeed paid $60,000 and deposited it to the exchange. That would be returned to us at the end if we fulfill our contract and would be taken from us if we default or refuse to comply with the contract. And that can serve as a sort of collateral if you're looking for an analogy from the banking perspective. 
So here we can calculate the value of our current account after any margin payment that took place. So here it's quite intuitive. We're just adding up the value of the current account at the start plus any margin payments if they took place. But later on is where it starts being interesting. They exchange every single day, or even more frequently most of the time, undertakes the procedure that is called marking to market. It means that it adjusts the nominal value of our current account to reflect the incremental payoff we have encountered at this day. So here, for example, at the end of our first day, they would see that our contract would have led us to lose uh, more than $13,000 at that particular day. So what they would do is they would reduce the value or nominal value of our margin account by $13,100. Bear in mind that the $60,000 that we've paid still remain there, safely stored within the exchange. This is just a nominal procedure they do. Then what they do next is they compare the marked to market value of your current account to the margin call threshold. And the margin call threshold is some value that's typically lower than the initial margin that represents a risk that this loss that you've encountered, and here this value shows that you have made a loss of $13,100, isn't it? If this loss is high enough for the exchange to worry that you might default strategically, well, then the exchange can just make you, or at least politely ask you, to deposit additional funds into your margin account so that the nominal value of your marked to market margin account is back at the value of the initial margin, so $60,000. So here what we need to do, we need to check if the value of our marked to market current account is less than the margin call threshold, then we need to top it up provide additional payments to the exchange so that the mark to market value of the current account is back at $60,000. So we can just get the initial margin and subtract the value of the current account here, because here, in case we have got a margin call situation, our current account value plummeting below 45,000, we would top it up until 60,000. And if it's not the case, if we are somewhere in the safer territory as we are here, I mean, we almost broke into 45,000 but haven't yet, then the exchange would leave us roam free and not request us to top it up and uh, continue monitoring the situation and constantly marking the value of our current account to market. So zero instead. And here, the value of our current account after margin payments, if any took place, would be just the sum of the two. And now we can automatically apply this formula to every single trading day and see whether there has been any margin calls triggered and uh, how much have we ended up paying to the exchange overall. And we can see that we didn't need to wait long until the first margin call triggered. It happened on the second day when the value of the current account plummeted to slightly above $30,000, reflecting that we lost totally uh, almost $30,000 by entering the futures contract at this stage, given that the futures price at this very day was less than $40, and we, as the longing counterparty, were perhaps quite disappointed that we agreed to pay $42.75. And uh, worrying that we might default strategically here, the exchange approached us and asked to top our current account up so that the mark to market value is back at 60,000. And this happened solely because this value of 30,600 is lower than 45,000, which is the margin call threshold. If we look further down, let's see if any other margin calls triggered, and it did, they did. Here, on the 29th of October 2020, another margin call triggered here by a very fine margin, no pun intended, 
when the futures price has plummeted further down to 38.26 dollars per barrel, hovering actually quite higher than the initial price until this moment. And here we were required to deposit $15,500 extra to continue maintaining our futures contract. If we refused to top up our margin account, then the exchange would simply consider us defaulting on the contract, taking all the margin payments we have paid so far, deposited so far, and compensated our counterparty with such proceeds. And here we can see what was the value of our current account at the very end, and it has been $153,300. And, uh, well, it might seem quite arbitrary and not telling you anything, but hang on for a second, we can derive a lot from it. Well, first of all, we can calculate how many margin calls happened throughout the period, so we can just count if positive entries in this column, except for the very first payment, which is the initial margin payment, and it happens regardless. And we can see that there were two, and we have identified them both. Now we can uh, calculate the total sum of all margin payments. So how much of actual cash did we deposit within the exchange throughout the period? So we can sum this column, including the initial margin payment, and we can see that to maintain our long futures contract, we needed to deposit more than $100,000 over the course of this contract within the exchange, which can, which can seem quite inefficient because, again, you need to withdraw cash from some other operations to simply deposit within the exchange. And that can be, first of all, quite disappointing and second, quite stressful for in terms of um, liquidity. And uh, then we can also retrieve the final value of our current account at the very last day. And then we can actually calculate our contract payoff from these two values. Turns out our contract payoff is equal to the value of our current account marked to market at the very end, minus any margin payments we have deposited during the lifetime of the contract. And as those two numbers are the same, we can be sure that all calculations have been prudent. And uh, it's actually unsurprising that this identity holds true, given the fact that the current account value reflects both the payments that we made and also the payoff that has been accumulating throughout the period. So the sum of the two should indeed give that value. And by extension, this difference should give us the contract payoff. Again, here, this simple case illustrates how important margining is and how it transforms risk. To start with, we got our business risk, that is basically the exposure of a manufacturing company to ever-changing oil price. A forwards contract that uh, does not involve an exchange allows you, potentially, to hedge this business risk. But financial risk of strategic defaults, or just honest defaults really, occurs from uh, this transaction, because you cannot really be sure whether your counterparty would honor their obligation if doing so is unprofitable for them, especially in absence of effective reputational mechanisms. Then exchanges come into play and uh, design margining and uh, margin calls and uh, marking to market to protect counterparties against strategic defaults to enable liquid and uh, safe futures trading. But then margin calls can trigger liquidity risk concerns, given the fact that a lot of counterparties trade oil futures or other commodity futures. It means that large changes, large swings in commodity prices can trigger loads of margin calls across a number of counterparties across the whole market, meaning that there would be huge demand for liquid cash to deposit within the exchanges to continue maintaining those contracts. And that is at least one of the playing parts of 
many financial crises, including the 2007-2008 one, when commodity prices were quite volatile and uh, liquidity risk concerns were not were if not caused but massively alleviated by waves of margin calls. And this simple case of futures trading tells you how important it is to understand that the risk never goes away. It just is being transformed into other forms and types. And that's all there is for long futures trading on this simple case study for crude oil futures trading. And in the next video, we'll discuss short futures trading on the example of wheat futures. So please stay tuned. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions and videos for business economics or finance topics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much.